Well, welcome, Deanna, to the Flower Podcast. I'm so excited to have you on. I'm so honored to be here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. I, I was just really, really glad. I know we talked, uh, what now, a couple of weeks ago, three weeks yeah. ago, and you were so patient because we were going back and forth during my move, and it was just a little bit insane trying to keep up with everybody and everything. And um, right now, as we're recording this, it's the, about almost the middle of November already, um, and I can't wait to release this episode uh, in just a few weeks. But um, I'm just, I'm just glad to have you. I think it's going to be a great, great hour and I cannot wait for what you have to share. Thank you. I'm dr- really excited to get to visit and get to be here with you. So, okay. So I always like to start at the beginning and how did you get into this wacky world of flowers? Oh man. Um, well, I guess probably it would have started with my horse addiction as a small child. So <laughs> okay, when I was a kid, did you, I, did you say yeah. horses? Horses. Okay. I was a horse crazy kid. <laughs> okay. um, and I was sharing with you a little earlier um, a bit of our, my family story is that we grew up kind of poverty level. And I wasn't even aware of that as a kid. My parents, we were so richly loved. And so our lives were so abundant in so many other ways. We didn't really notice there was a financial lack, except that the whole time I was wishing for a horse, my parents kept saying, Great, but you're going to have to find a way to pay for it. Um, and so I did. Um, my first job was actually, I was like 12 or 13 and watered flowers at the nursery. And then that led to a job working in a flower shop. Um, and then I um, never even had a thought to pursuing that as a career and went off and went into elementary education. And my husband and I started our family and I was home with kids and then was actually really kind of struggling with some feelings of, you know, I'd step back from my career and home full time and struggling with feelings of isolation. And so gardening for me became my outlet. And so that's kind of where things all started to click into place. So I had a few of these skills that I'd learned, um, you know, when I was a kid working at the flower shop, it wasn't like I was a trained designer or anything, but a few skills enough to think, well, I could try this. And so gardening became an outlet for me and a way to connect with people and one thing led to another and I decided I'd start a small business because that seemed like a grand idea with a toddler and a baby at home. Um, <laughs> so that's how I started Twig and Vine, which is our um, now our farm. And at that point, we were living on one acre. And four years ago, we bought our farm that we're on now. So we're on a 10 acre farm. Wow. A very small chunk of that is actually flowers. So now we grow um, cut flowers, primarily dahlias. Uh, yeah. So that's kind of the the winding weaving journey of how we got to be here where we are. That's incredible. So when you were working in that flower shop and then how many years went, I mean, you said you had, you got married, you had your family. Yeah, how many yeah. years w- w- were between, you know, the, the flower shop, what, you know, whatever to, okay, this, this idea that I need to get back into gardening. Yeah. So I, let's see, I was 16. I worked at the flower shop 16 until I was a sophomore in college. Um, And then my husband and I, that's another fun part of our story too. We were babies when we got married. So I was just, uh, just finished my associate's degree, um, turned 20 on our honeymoon. (laughs) And we, um, Yeah. So from that point on, I went into elementary education. So it was probably from the time I left the flower shop until the time I really started pursuing gardening with a passion, I would say it must have been, you know, like you mark time with your kids this age, I would say like six, six, seven years. Um, So, I mean, it was a chunk of time. I mean, it was. Yeah. And I kind of toyed with, you know, you know, played out in the flower beds and planted things every year, but it wasn't really until that season of my life where I really found my groove in the garden and really pursued it. So, wow, that's, that's I love that. Do you did you find back then that there was a particular part of it that you loved um, or that you missed? Was it the actual growing part of it? Was it the just being around flowers part of it? I'm just yeah. trying to kind of get an idea. I of think what was in your mind. I think it was probably a little bit of both. I think it, I didn't realize how much I enjoyed um, being immersed in flowers in those years that I was at the flower shop until I um, 
had the experience to start cutting and growing on my own and being able to bring in an abundance and be able to play with flowers and not have it be, I think that was a really big piece for me too. It wasn't, there wasn't an expectation. It was just, I brought some flowers in, I was going to see what I could do with them. And so it was really from a sense of play that it kind of first started. And actually, I can remember very distinctly this moment of having you know, cut flowers and brought them in and put together a bouquet and I held it up and I was looking at it. And I remember thinking, I'd pay money for this. And it was like kind of that <laughs> click moment of, hey, hmm. if, if I would pay money for this, maybe this is something I can do on the side. And at that season we were at in our lives, um, you know, I wasn't working any longer. So it was, how could I work creatively from home and have time for something that I loved and maybe have it be something that add, added to our family and our income. So. Mm, oh, that's great. Um, I, I feel like it's, it's always funny when people look back and they, and they see that moment when they would like what you just described, you, you, you put those flowers together and you're like, I would pay money for that. You know, yeah, I think yeah. that's, I think that's really kind of cool. And um, it's neat to have that light bulb moment kind of go off and, and then be able to go from there. And so, so you started that and then did you start twig and vine before you bought your other property or was that kind of all at the same time, part of this evolution? Um, over, over a course of time. So, um, again, my husband and I got married really young and um, we bought our very first little house. He was 18. We bought our first little house. We had a you know, a tiny little yard and you, know, you take those baby steps. We both grew up on farms. Um, his family more of a working farm, my family just, you know, kind of a hobby farm. And that was something that we both really knew from our experience growing up that we really wanted for our, for ourselves and for our children. We really want to be able to give our kids that. And so our um, place that we were on when we had our first two kiddos and I first started really getting into gardening, we had about an acre, um, which was lovely and wonderful. And it would have been more than enough space to grow flowers. But we really wanted our kids to have the opportunity, you know, to raise animals and have all the forts in the woods and, you know, do all the things that we had the privilege of doing when we were growing up. And so we saved and looked for our farm for years and years. And it really, um, it just felt like it was meant to be. Um, mm. And so it was years from the time that we bought our first tiny little house with a tiny little yard. So we bought... Um, the farm that we're on now. So from the point that I started Twig and Vine until we bought our real farm um, was about three years. Um, so and and, I, I oh, and one of those this. years, oh yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 I'm sorry. I just want to ask this because people who are listening that may not know this, where are you located? Oh, great question. We're um, about an hour north of Seattle. We actually live in a oh. tiny little town. Um, it's called Conway. Um, so we're in the famous um, Skagit Valley. Um, so people are really familiar with it being just, it's a really incredible growing area. We have all the tulip fields, just incredible agriculture in our area. The irony is we're actually not in the valley. We're right up on the hill. So um, we don't have the renowned soil, but we do get to live in the area with that growing culture. So it's really cool. That's amazing. Well, I didn't realize that's exactly where you were. I knew you were up in the up in that area, but um, that's uh, you know, one of these days I'm going to get up there and and, Dude, re and and really be jealous and envious of mm -hmm. the growing climate for sure. Well, um, okay, so tell us about Twig and Vine. Tell us about your your flower business, kind of how you know your business model is. What what is it you try to do? Yeah, I know that you yeah. have a lot going on, and so I'm, I'm kind of curious to, for everyone to learn. I think we, yeah, I think we all do, right? We're always wearing all the different hats. Um, Indeed. So my business model started out, you know, that like I have this idea. When I first started out, I really didn't know there was such a thing as this, you know, a, a studio florist. Like I thought you either had a flower shop for, I don't know what you were. And so the only thing that I saw anybody doing with flowers at that point was um, wedding design. And so it seemed like, well, maybe that would be a good niche to go into. You know, I can fit it in on the weekends when my mm -hmm. husband's home. Um, so I started um, kind of building, you know, as a, as a wedding designer um, and small scale. It wasn't like, you know, jumped into giant weddings or anything, but I really quickly found out um, how critical it was that I leaned into my strengths. Um, and it okay. took a little while to learn and accept what those were. Um, so for me, weddings were not my strength um, and they weren't a good fit 
for us as a family. You know, we had really little babies and inevitably, you know, somebody would be up with an ear infection or, you know, those kind of things on a wedding weekend. And it just, we realized it wasn't the life. It wasn't adding to our life. It was taking away. Mm -hmm. And so then you start to look at like what other models there were. And so I started a roadside stand. Um, We lived in an area that had decent amount of, you know, traffic. So I could grow the flowers and sell them from there. And that really started um, the wheels turning with being able to grow market flowers. And so when we um, moved on to our real farm, um, we were doing subscription sales and some pop-up sales, um, things like that, a lot of retail sales. And that was working fairly well, but again, still not leaning into my strengths entirely. So I was realizing um, pretty quickly the thing that, um, you know, we could either fight it or we could follow it. Um, And for me, my strength was still in teaching. Um, There were times where I thought, why, you know, should I still be teaching? Is this, is this the right career path to be on? And so it was when I learned to embrace those strengths. um, I kind of on a whim um, taught a wreath workshop in our barn in our, I mean, it was, I look back and I think, oh, what a gift to just jump. Um, I mean, we didn't have heat. We had terrible lights. We had just moved onto our farm. And the story about our farm too is when we bought it, it had been a rental for years and years and it was tired and worn out and not, not like some beautiful, um, you know, out of the country home magazine, you know, antique vintage, everything. It was old and worn out with a double wide trailer and a tin barn. Like it wasn't, it wasn't anything, um, that you would put on the front of your advertisement, come to our barn and hang out. But it's not I put like on the, your Christmas cards or anything. No. Uh, so <laughs> I put out the invitation though, and people showed up. And so that first workshop taught me one, how my, the joy of being able to combine these two things that, that I loved. And, you know, they, they, um, you know, talk about like being in your groove or being in your flow. And for me, that was being able to combine gathering people and teaching with this creative process that I loved. And so getting to actually lead people through that creative process, just it clicked for me so much that this is what I wanna be doing. I wanna be gathering and connecting people and getting to connect to people and get to um, walk them to the joy of learning how to create something. And so from those tiny little wreath workshops, um, that's really kind of how our business model shifted and changed. So it wasn't very long after that that I um, stopped taking weddings. Ironically, the year that I stopped taking weddings, I had more inquiries than ever. Oh, wow. um, it's, and that's it's crazy the yeah, way that that's happens. how it works. Um, but it was a really good shift for me. It felt like, um, it felt joyful. It felt like it aligned with um, the opportunities and time that we had as a family. And so we've been slowly growing our farm and our infrastructure on our farm to be able to host more events. And so some of those have been um, workshops that I teach Um, and workshops, not like, you know, we're not talking robust, you know, week long, we're talking, you know, afternoon, you know, playing and frolicking in the flowers and making a holiday wreath and those kind of things. But one thing that's been really joyful that's come from um, kind of moving into this model of being um, a teaching space is that we've had the privilege of welcoming other instructors to our farm to teach. And so like really? the, the year we've been able to host, um, you know, my friend, Sarah Simon, who's the mint gardener. Um, she's come and taught watercolor classes at our farm, you know, things like that, that have just been another layer of being able to connect um, community and gather people together and invite people into a place of rest and gathering and beauty. And so it's been, that's been a really exciting exciting um, process of learning to let go of what I thought um, the business model had to be and instead standing, um, just learning and finding where I needed to be. And I think that um, that's, I think it's a journey we all make, you know, and letting go of the expectations of what we think it should look like or everyone else is doing or it is supposed to look like and really leaning in and, and recognizing our own strengths and, and leading with those. So yeah, that's what, that's kind of the process for Twig and Vine. Mm. Um, I, I just, I don't want to, I want to take a second and just, you made a point that I feel like I don't want people to miss. And, 
and when you mentioned the watercolor classes, um, I, I feel like so many times we don't give ourselves permission to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of what you're alluding to. Well, it's exactly what you're saying. You know, we, it's, it's sometimes letting go of those things that are getting, are hindering you. But at the same time, you have this great facility, you have this place that you've grown and you're developing and, and these connections you're making. Why not include somebody in some creative space that might need a space? I mean, that would love mm -hmm. to teach a class and, mm -hmm. and embrace that and use that. And, and I think that's, that's kind of, I mean, that's really cool. And, and it just kind of helps, uh, as you said, adds another layer to what you do. And, yeah. Yeah, totally. And I think a big part of it for me was I, actually, honestly, a really huge layer of vulnerability of being able to kind of throw open the doors and say, it's not, you know, it's not magazine pretty. It's not exactly what the expectation is. It's not what I want it to be someday, but, but it is what it is right now and welcome. And I think that that at the heart of, I was actually having a great conversation with a friend about that. That's, that's what hosting is. You know, a good host isn't necessarily someone who puts together, you know, the fanciest five course meal, but it's someone who throws open the doors and says, come as you are and makes you feel so welcome. And so I think that's been a really key piece for me as the business has grown to be able to, um, say here, here we are. And here's what the story really is. And I think that that was actually in going back one step. That was a key moment for me, actually. Um, it would have been our first year on our farm. So 2000 and whatever that six, well, anyways, you know, you're like trying to count back years. Anyways, yeah, first full year on the farm. Um, I actually had a really incredible opportunity. I was selected as a scholarship winner to Steve, um, uh, Sinclair and Moore. So Steve and Jamie Sinclair, um, Wow. Um, workshop, which was an incredible, incredible um, experience for me. And one of the things that I really learned to embrace from that experience here, I wasn't this, you know, the high end, beautiful, you know, weddings, um, you know, opportunity to learn the full backside of that. And Steve shared something that was just a tremendous aha moment for me. And he was talking about um, sharing on social media and sharing our story. And he said, what you think is your greatest weakness is probably your greatest strength. And it was a huge aha for me because here I was in this polished wedding industry and trying to hide all the mess of three little boys running around with no shirts and shoes on and you know, an ugly, messy farm and all of that and realizing that what I thought was the weakness was actually our greatest strength. And it was that we had this farm that we were growing together, you know, out of the muck and the mess from, you know, from what it was to what it could be and that we were doing it together as a family. Um, and once I started really embracing that and seeing that that was our strength and leading with that story and and seeing the beauty in that and not trying to hide, hide the mess, instead share the process of, what, process of what it was to build a farm and, and do it as a family. Um, and then to do it from a place of vulnerability to throw open the doors and say, welcome, come gather with us. Um, that was when things really shifted for me in terms of the business becoming what I really, I guess maybe you didn't even you didn't even had had the clarity at the beginning to see what it could be, but what it, it really was always supposed to be. No, that's so good. Um, I hope I hope there's a lot of people that hear that and and realize that it's that that real authentic self that welcomes people in and isn't apologetic and isn't you know it, it's just it's it's the human connection at that point, yes. you know, it's not yeah. about, I mean, sure, there are people out there that want the posh, the environment, the, you know, chic looking, you know, facilities and whatever and all that. But the thing about it is the, but I feel like what's lacking in most of those places is the sincerity and the realness that just being willing to be vulnerable and just 
you know, make those connections allows you that opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't get any other way other yep. than being real, just being you. And totally, totally. And I think that, that that, you know, at the end of the day, we are all, I mean, belonging is such, it's the most essential human need. And, but the only way we can really mm -hmm. truly do it is be who we really are. And that's been a really, it's been an incredible journey for me, learning, learning to, to just be who I really am and to find my own groove. I think we always, um, you know, we always jokingly um, share that quote, like, you know, be you, somebody else has already taken. But the thing is, is I think in, in our industry, I think that sometimes, especially when you're new coming into it, it can feel like there's already somebody doing that thing. And maybe there is somebody doing that things, but they're doing it in their way. And I think when we each are really true to who we are and what our strengths are, we bring something really unique to the table. And it's not like just adding another one of the same thing to the mix when we can step into who we are and what our strengths are and being vulnerable and real in that and, and leading and growing our businesses from that place. It, it creates this really dynamic, you know, um, playing field instead of a bunch of copy, you know, a bunch of, mm -hmm. you know, carbon copies of the same thing. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I guess I've really um, enjoyed, enjoyed learn, learning to embrace those things and kind of walk, walk through this journey. So. Mm, I love that. And of course, you part of your journey is is one of the main reasons why we're talking today. Yeah, yeah. And I am most excited to talk about this. Me too. Um, Me too. And so the Growing Kindness Project. Yeah. Um, tell us about that. Tell us how that got started. Yeah. Um, even though I think you've hinted at it a little bit. Um, yeah, yeah, I just don't, let's let's hear it all. Just turn okay. on the faucet and let it pour. All right. All right. So the Growing Kindness Project, oh man, so many, you know how all of our stories, there's all these pieces and threads that weave together. And then sure. all of a sudden it's like, oh, this is the beautiful tapestry that I was, you know, that was coming together all along. So again, you know, I think I'd, I'm really grateful for my experience growing up. I had some really incredible opportunities. And one of them was growing up in a tiny, tiny little town. Um, which was wonderful and terrible at the same time. Everybody knew, you know, everybody, you didn't go to the grocery store and not greet people by name. You didn't pump your gas without chatting with the person, you know, on the, with the pump across from you. Um, so it's this tremendous sense of, like we were talking about before, of belonging and being known and being a part of community and being connected. And we moved away and I didn't realize how much that was maybe woven into my very fiber mm. until I didn't have it. And always kind of seeking that in the communities where we lived. And so then um, flash forward, you know, we have kids and I really wanted my kids to grow up with a strong sense of being connected in their community and connected with the people around them and a strong sense of what it is to give back because I think that that's one of the best, I mean, it's just such an important characteristic that we wanted our children to have and also it's an incredible powerful tool to be able to be connected in your community and so when we first started growing flowers the kids and I started taking flowers to the long-term care home that was just a mile down the road and it would be I, I remember I had you know Emmett was a baby on my hip and Eli you know would be like hooked onto my purse and my other arm would have this bouquet and we'd you know, tootle into the long-term care home and drop off flowers for the foyer or wherever they could, you know, enjoy them. And then when we moved to the farm, our first year, and I joke that like all the best things in my life happened purely by accident, but truly, I mean, the first year growing on the farm, I mean, if you could, if you could have like a, a, a hit list of like the best, worst mistakes to make the first year, I did it, all of it, all of it. But weirdly, it ended up that we had this like flush of dahlias because I hadn't plotted and planned anything else right. We had sourcing issues. Um, just all the things like was this perfect storm. Didn't have enough market for all these flowers that I grew. Overestimated what I could grow and keep up with. You know, all the things. So we had this an abundance of flowers. So instead of just being able to have like a bouquet, you know, tucked under our arm to take in to give, we had like wagon loads like literal <laughs> wagon loads wow. so the kids at that point were a little bit older um 
And we started just finding ways to gift flowers in our community. And for us, the way that stuck the most was going to our local long-term care home. And this was obviously before the days of COVID. And we would load up the wagon with buckets of flowers and, you know, the little um, radio flyer, you know. Yeah, yeah. Little red wagon, yeah. So my kiddo, I have three little boys. So my kiddo, who's the shyest, but he was always in charge of pulling. Like he was like, I can do that. I can tow the wagon. And then the other kids would um, help hand out flowers. And so from that, um, I started realizing that there's tremendous, um, there's this tremendous opportunity for connection with flowers. I think we all intuitively know that in the floral industry, but flowers truly are a catalyst for connection. They open doors and hearts. Like the only other things that I've seen that can do it like flowers is if you walk in a room with a puppy or a baby, like (laughs) otherwise bring flowers if you don't have a puppy or a baby, but Uh truly people warm and soften in a way that's so unique um, when we hold out flowers. And so we saw this like tremendous opportunity in that. And then beyond that, um, for me, it was such a gift. It was such a gift to be able to have my kids experience what it was like to give freely and make connections. For me, it was so joyful to get to go and, you know, hear stories of, oh, I used to grow dahlias and just make little moments of connection. Um, But then this thing happened that I didn't anticipate. And it was, so I I figured it would be joyful for us as a family. And I figured it would be joyful for the recipient of the flowers. But what I didn't anticipate was anyone who observed this, what was happening, entered into the joy equally. Mm -hmm. So the staff with the long-term care, family and friends that were there visiting would come up and say, that just made my day to see somebody else being gifted flowers. So it kind of started this wheels turning process of there's a process of understanding there's equal joy in the story. Mm. And we all know the world certainly could use more happy stories. And so that's where I got up um, the courage to share a little bit about what we were doing um, and sharing how we were giving flowers and how joyful it was to us and what happened next. And my, my hope and anticipation with that was that it would be a joyful, if it was joyful for these people who are observing, then it would be a joyful for a person who could partake in the story as well. And it was. Um, but what I didn't anticipate next was people started reaching out and saying, I'm so inspired what you're doing. I want to do the same thing too. Um, I don't have a garden. How can I share flowers? And ask, you know, asking for advice and direction and support. And so I didn't really know what to do with that. So you kind of tuck that away, you know, that first summer. And that first following spring, um, after we'd had this bumper crop of dahlias, and then miraculously, um, it felt miraculous. It was a ton of blood, sweat, and tears. Sure. Um, our dahlia tubers, you know, as you know, you dig them and store them over the winter, and then you're able to divide them, um, you know, at any point, but we divided it in the spring. So I was standing in my barn dividing tubers, and it was just this like abundance of tubers. And I realized I'm literally holding the key in my hand to make this happen. Because I, I can't, um, we can only reach so far. Like the little red wagon and the, my three boys and I, we can only tow these flowers so far out in our community. But what if, you know, teach a man, so to speak, I got to teach a man to fish, so to speak. We mm-hmm. could, mm-hmm. We could in, equip other people to do the same. And so we opened our farm that year and we gave away hundreds and hundreds of dolly tubers. And just with the invitation, if you want to grow flowers and give them away, come get dolly tubers and they're yours. We would love to see you be able to do this and replicate it um, in your in your neighborhood, in your community. So you and didn't so charge just, people to come get them? They could just, mm-hmm. like you save some for yourself, obviously mm-hmm. you plant next year, and then you had this these leftover and then you just let mm-hmm. them go out into the universe. Mm-hmm. Well. And it was such an incredible, it was, it was such a powerful experience. And so what we found was that people were reaching back out over the summer and sharing what they were doing with the flowers and sharing how it had helped them to be able to reach out in their communities. And so that's really kind of the seed of where the Growing Kindness Project got started. And as that story got out, then people were saying, well, I don't, I don't need tubers, but I, do, I need to teach me, help, help me, show me what to do. And so that's really where we realized that we could create community around this. Um, and 
so that's how the Growing Kindness Project has started. And, and there's nothing, there is not, I mean, gifting flowers and kindness, like that's, that's as old as flowers themselves, I'm sure. I'm sure people have been mm. reaching out and using flowers as a tool for connection forever. Like that is not a new or novel idea. But we found that there was a lot of power in creating a team around it. You know, there's something really motivating and inspiring when we can link arms and do something together with like-minded people and be cheered on and encouraged in that. And so the project is kind of equal parts being a part of community and team and being cheered on and supported and kind of just having that connection um, with people, like-minded people who are on the same journey, but also having support and resources and um, being able to get your growing, kind, your growing questions answered and information and education. Um, we found a lot of people, the, the project has grown really, it's a very incredibly diverse bunch. You know, it, it, we have a lot of home gardeners, we have some flower farmers, some floral designers, um, a really eclectic mix. Um, but a lot of people in the project are pretty new to growing flowers. And so it's been just cheering them on and supporting them, you know, as they, as they get going and plant their flower pots on their patio and their backyard gardens. But I, I feel like it's a little bit in a way, like right now where we're at, I think that we all, we, we want it, we want to do something, right? We want to be able to, to be connected in our communities and, to do something to help. Um, but it sometimes feels overwhelming to know where to even start. And yeah. I think that that's been the power of the project is just start where you are and use what you have. And so it's really as simple as plant a seed, grow a flower, cut it, go give it to somebody. Um, and, and really encouraging and cheering people on in that. that it's, just, it's as simple as starting where you are and using what you have. Um, I think so oftentimes we can feel like we're drowning a little bit in that sea of not enough. Um, you know, like it, it feels like small, small efforts maybe aren't a big thing and yet there's tremendous power in them. I think honestly, that's where the real power for changes, um, in our communities and even in our own lives, um, just the, those efforts that we're able starting where we are and doing what we can holds tremendous power. And so that's been the mission of the project is to encourage people to start in simplicity and, and do what you can, whether that's a pot of flowers that you plant on your back patio or whether that's, you know, a little corner you tuck away out of your vegetable patch, or it's a, you know, what, whatever that, that is for you, you know, starting in, in that place and doing what you can and knowing that that contribution, um, that planting that seed will, will bring forth a um, opportunity for a real connection in your community. So, mm. you know, I think sometimes people just, you know, it's like they want, you know, they hear about stuff like this or, you know, they, they read about it on social media and it's almost like they don't, they don't know how, they know they want to do something, but they don't know what, where, how to begin, like you just said. And, it's great to kind of come alongside what you've already created and you provide this conduit of, um, you know, support or whether it's, I mean, I, I guess, why don't you share that? Tell us how, how do you, if somebody wants to become, um, and I'm not sure the terminology, but they want to join your project mm -hmm. and they want to be a part of your team, or I know you have like a couple different levels. Um, tell us about that because I feel like, you know, I know when we were talking earlier before we started recording, you know, one of the things that I, I wrote down because it just, it meant so much to me what to hear you say that is so many times we think, and you hinted at it a second ago, that the, we don't, we just, we don't have enough. We don't have what it takes. Right. We don't, right. We don't, um, I don't know the right terminology because you said it perfectly then, but it's, and maybe I'll just let you say it again, but it's, it's like, we don't have enough but people don't realize how blessed we are how, or what we do have and the difference that we can make with just that little bit. And absolutely. Yeah. You know, and it's, and sometimes I know I used to be um, uh, associated with uh, a, a group that worked with orphans in Swaziland down near South Africa. And because that particular organization, it, it, 
was dealing with um, this huge crisis that was because of AIDS and parents were dying at 20. Mm-hmm. The average like life expectancy for a man was like 27 years old. Well, and, and of course, you know, you got moms and dads dying at a really young age and these kids that are growing up through this. And it's like an overwhelming um, burden to really kind of embrace. But, you know, a lot of times, you know, one of the things that the leaders at the time were very much about is like, if you can just, if you can make a difference in one person's life Mm -hmm. and the ripple effect of that. And so it isn't always about the numbers. Sometimes it's just about, you know, because if you're in a small community, one or two people might have a huge impact. And so, and so anyway, I'm, I'm sitting here saying something to you that obviously you know. And it- no, no, it's always so affirming and encouraging to hear that though. And that's one thing that we found as we got going in the project was like, wow, we have this sheer you know, volume of flowers to share. And so this summer we had opportunity to continue. Um, we had opportunity to share at Food Bank, actually. We couldn't even share at Long Term. Right. Um, and so we were able to drop off, you know, these um, big loads of flowers, the food bank each week was, which was incredible and exciting to know that along with the flowers, I love, I'm going to like sidetrack a little bit here, but so I don't, my friend, Sarah, um, Sarah Simon, she shared this with me and I wasn't familiar with it. Um, the language of flowers, Dahlia means dignity. Mm. And so this summer, as we were gifting flowers to our food bank, it was just such an encouraging thought for me to know that, you know, along with getting basic human needs met, they were, the people that came through there each week were getting just a little, a little bit of beauty in terms of remember that they deserve that. And, and that Dahlia said dignity. I just, I thought that was so powerful. Mm, so one is. thing we found though, over the course of getting to share flowers like that in these big drop-offs, um, you know, we weren't really actually getting to engage so much with people is that truly I think the power in the project isn't in the numbers. Um, that was really it, it, it proved itself out to me this summer. It's not in the numbers, it's in those meaningful connections. And so even if you're able to gift, you know, one flower to your neighbor and it be, you know, a moment of connection and encouragement and hope and kindness for that person, then that's, that has tremendous power because like you said, the ripple effect of that goes out beyond farther than what we can, can see and understand. And and so, um, can't remember how you were like, you're gonna have an awkward pause. Here's my awkward pause. <laughs> God, I really just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you could cut these out. Um, okay, so we were talking about, sorry, I gotta backtrack. So we we're talking about, oh, that's just starting where you are and it doesn't feel like it's enough. So there really truly is tremendous power in one small act of kindness. And I don't think we can ever devalue that. And I think that that's what the project is really about is welcoming people into the opportunity to do whatever they can. Um, and, and that might be just taking flowers to your elderly neighbor for the summer, or it might be, you know, gifting flowers to, you know, someone who's going through a really tough time. Um, but it doesn't have, it's certainly, not about volume and it will never be about volume. Um, We've really realized there's no way that you can quantify a quality moment of connection. You know, it's not, it's not an account of numbers. And so it's been really exciting to welcome people in to support them in starting where they are and, and using what they have because there is tremendous power for change and connection, you know, even if you grow one tiny little flower and that's the only opportunity that you have to share, you know, throughout the entire growing season, like that is meaningful and that is significant. Mm, I love that. Do you, um, let, let's, if you don't mind, I, I want to hear um, how do people become a part of this project? How, um, uh, you know, tell us more about the details of the project. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we like to say that if you've got a little bit of dirt and a big heart, you have what it takes <laughs> to grow kindness. That's all Love you that. need. It's all you need. Um, you know, there's, there's, I think somehow in the gardening world, cut flowers are more intimidating to people than vegetables. Um, 
I think no, because I, maybe we don't think we, yeah, I, I, it surprises me that people say that I've grown vegetables for years and always been intimidated by cut flowers or never thought I could grow cut flowers. And so um, it's just been a really a process of supporting people with um, just basic information to encourage and support them each step of the way. Um, and we're, I'm very, very excited. Um, you know, this first year has been, this was our first year that we launched nationally. We launched nationally at the Team Flower Conference in Pasadena um, last January. And so it's been the first year of having a national ambassador team in place and a worldwide gardener team in place. And so it's been a huge, huge year for learning, huge year for learning, um, just trying to figure out what it is that the project can do and what it needs to do and how it can better support people. And one of the things that we've seen is that people just need access to resources that can help them get going. And so that is um, what we are extending and expanding next year to be able to really support people in that. So if anybody wanted to get involved with the project, okay, Scott, I did it again. I'm sorry, because you asked a question and I went off on this tangent. Um, so you're like, <laughs> you're fine. You're good. Okay. So, um, so if you have a little bit of dirt and a big heart, you have what it takes to grow kindness in your community. And so to become involved in the project, anyone can sign up. You do not have to be an expert gardener. You do not have to be a flower farmer. You do not have to be a floral designer. If you bring those skills to the table, again, it's that starting where you are and using what you have. So you have the capacity to do this in the, uh, you know, a, a skilled and broad way. Um, but you can be a beginning gardener and never have planted a seed before and be here. So um, we are found this last year um, that it has been really helpful to offer two different levels um, of engagement for people in the project. And so the first year that we started out, um, we just gave away Dahlia tubers. And then we realized really quickly, like, oh, we kind of just launched these people and didn't really gift them with the support and continued education that they needed to feel successful in that. Mm, so we yeah. realized the second year we needed to provide support for them. And that's when we created the ambassador team and the ambassador team is a group of individuals who grow and share flowers in their community. And they're also quite literally being ambassadors of the project and sharing the heart and the mission of the project and inviting people to join and be a part of it alongside them and alongside all of us. Um, and so the ambassador team um, gave us an opportunity to do a smaller group um, and more, um, more specific education. And in that process, we learned how to kind of format that to be able to reach more people and be a better support to more people. So mm -hmm. now we have the Growing Kindness ambassador team. And to be an ambassador, we do look for people who are really willing to make a commitment to the project for a year and really willing to... Um, commit some growing space and time and um, are excited about the project and want to share and want to share the mission of the project in their communities. And so the ambassador applications um, open up in January. And so we're picking ambassadors for 2021. Um, this year we had a national team that all across the United States um, and each of those um, ambassadors were gifted with uh, dye tubers and growing supplies and then we had um, we'd intended to have some in-person learning experiences but obviously this year right. that was an option so we did um, a lot of online learning experiences and then um, digital resources and support to keep them connected and being a part of um, we also had a community group hub so everyone could come and ask their questions and share their ideas and just have that sense of team so um the ambassador team will be, or the ambassador applications will be accepted again in January. So if anyone was interested and really wanted to step into a place of, of leadership and um, making a commitment and having a higher level of resources and support um, to get going, um, those will be open in January. And then right now, as of um, well, this will air in December, right? Our Growing Kindness Gardener um, enrollment is open. So a Growing Kindness Gardener differs just a little bit in a growing, than a Growing Kindness Ambassador in that you're not getting provided with the actual hard goods and then our ambassadors get a, an added layer of education and support. Um, but next year, I'm really excited because we realized there was this kind of level in between um, being an ambassador and being a gardener where people really 
there was a niche that, that people wanted to step into and um, people mm -hmm. that were ready to make a commitment to the project who wanted more resources, who wanted more connection, who wanted more opportunities to learn. And so this year, um, and or excuse me, next year in 2021, right. we're rolling out an opportunity to join as a growing kind of cultivator. So getting um, higher level of resources and education and support without stepping in the place of leadership as an ambassador. Um, and one thing that I'm really tremendously excited about that we excited about that we are um, that we have launched this month is an opportunity to grow um, kindness in your community right now. Uh, and I know that most people are no longer in the growing season, so it feels a little bit like, yeah. what do you mean by that? I can't grow and give flowers in the middle of the winter unless you're in the southern hemisphere. But um, one thing that we have found, and it's been a really exciting opportunity, is the things that, um, what started out on our little farm, um, we realized was things that we could share with others and equip them and make replicable in other communities. Mm. So one thing that we've um, done over the last few years is donated um, holiday centerpieces um, at the Christmas distribution at our food bank each year. Um, so when the families come to pick up their turkey and fixings and all the things for their Christmas meal, we are also able to gift them with a little bit of beauty. Um, and we all know that flowers are a luxury item and so it felt like a really exciting opportunity to be able to share that with those families, especially at that time of the year. So what we're doing this year is we've taken everything that we've learned about that process of, of um, creating a, um, so we could all the centerpiece drive the first few years, and we've wrapped that into um, an entire small, I don't want to say a course, but it's an entire set of resources for people to be able to do the same in their communities. So to know how to source, um, you know, using, starting where you are, again, starting where you are, using what you have, be able to put together some kind of centerpiece and maybe that, um, you know, you can get together and do that with a group of, you know, family and friends and you're able to share with your food bank or your local long-term care, or maybe you make one and share it with your elderly next door neighbor. But we're calling it, it's, it's called the Growing Kindness Holiday uh, Cheer Campaign. And our hope is, again, just affirming that message of let's just all start where we are and use what we have. So, you know, here in the Pacific Northwest, we have evergreens all over the place. So it's getting creative and looking around and using the resources that we have available to us and putting a little bit of love into it and crafting it into something beautiful that we can then reach out and use as a tool to create connection in our communities. And so... Um, really excited anyone who is signed up as a growing kind of gardener which you can do at any point um, just hop over onto the website and sign up you'll get a set of digital uh, resources right sent right to you get to be a part of the team and you'll get all the heads up on everything that's coming in 2021 because there's a lot of really exciting pieces um, so anyone that signed up to be a gardener will get all of those resources um, to be able to reach out in their communities at Christmas time and grow uh, and give give some some kind of beauty and kindness and create a moment of connection i think that's so great and and i and i do like the way you emphasize you know even if it's just your uh neighbor next door that maybe would never do something like that and you know or it's or doing it as a as a family project Yes. Yep. Um, you know, and you may have family like, like we do, like we, in this area, we have several people in our family and everyone can pitch in, you know, it doesn't just have to be little kids. It doesn't have to be, right. you know, it can be, it can be every, anyone and everyone. Yep. It's, and, and again, the heart of this project is about creating connection and creating community. And I have loved so much the it's been really encouraging to me to hear the feedback from people in the project this year who said, I joined this because I felt like I needed to do something for somebody else. I had no idea that it would be such a gift to me. Um, Anne Frank says, um, well, she says her, there's an Anne Frank quote that I love, and it says, we never grow poor by giving um, because we really truly are enriched by it. And so creating opportunities to give freely 
um, is so enriching for us and for whoever we invite in to be a part of that process with us. And so for the Growing Kindness Holiday Cheer campaign, you know, that might be that your, you know, your husband and your kids join you around the kitchen table and you make a handful of little centerpieces, you know, to deliver to the neighborhood. Or it might be that you get together with your book club gals and everybody brings faces and everybody brings an armload of, you know, foliages that they had in their yard. And together you craft those and maybe, you, you know, they make a difference and donate them to the women's shelter. Or um, it could be, you know, it could really be as simple or as expansive as you have the capacity, uh, you know, have the capacity for. So, and that's one thing that we've really, truly loved about the project too, is that everybody who comes to the project um, sees a different need in their community. Mm. Uh, the needs that I see in my community are different than, so we have ambassadors, you know, several ambassadors in our Washington team who live local to me and they see different needs in our community. And it's so incredible that everyone reaches out um, and makes a connection in the area that they most see it. Um, you know, it may be a neighbor that no one else is seeing. It may be someone who's you know, struggling in a way that only you see, or it may be a community need that maybe isn't on somebody else's radar and, and you are seeing it and noticing it. So. I think there's a lot of a beauty in that too. And we each, again, kind of reflecting back to what we were talking about earlier, when we each embrace who we are and, and the strengths that we have and with the Grand Kennis Project, embracing the needs that we see, you know, are going to be each uniquely different. And the thing is, is I know I hear this a lot in different podcasts I listen to that um, and, and and what you said just it just re resonated with what I've heard, and that is, you know, we're each here for a reason, for a purpose, and and that's part of the beauty of having uh, so many different people involved. Is wherever you are, wherever you're put, wherever you you know have have put roots down, mm -hmm. you're going to see something that is a need that that. And the next person 10 houses down doesn't see. And, you know, that's what makes this so special, I think, is it doesn't, there's no boundaries on that, you know? Truly, Whether it's a truly. woman's shelter or it's a food bank or, um, you know, maybe you're part of a church and they have, uh, you know, shut-ins and people that, you mm -hmm. know, because of their age or things, they can't get out. And I, I just think, you know, there's, there's always somebody in our life that, or there's some, uh, some part of our life that we we see these needs and no two people are going to be the same right um, right and i think and that's we, where the ripple effects just get gigantic at that point truly truly i think because like you know like we we're talking about about vulnerability and authenticity um when we're willing to just stand in the place of like you said where we're where we really where we are where we're planted and be who we really are and look with our you know and, and lean into that um there's such a tremendous capacity for real connection. And I, I love that flowers are just, honestly, I think that the shot of courage that we sometimes need, I would have never had the, I would have never had the courage to walk into long-term care and say, Hey, can we just visit with people? Like I, I it would have, it would have felt really intimidating, but to have flowers in our hand, it gave us this incredible tool. It was like the shot of courage that I needed, you know, to be able to, to step into the connections that I wanted to make. And I, I love that we each have that available to us to be able to open doors and open hearts. You know, when we can just hang on to hang on to some flowers and then reach out in the place where we are being who we really are. I always like to ask, you know, that last question about advice and I feel like what you just said is so powerful. Is there anything else that you, uh, I don't know, maybe is on your heart to share that um, maybe you want to make sure you leave people with? I think it probably is an Anne, the Anne Frank quote. Um, that has been, it's been just proven to me over and over again these last few years. And she said, we never grow poor by giving. And I think in a world where the voices in our head are screaming, not enough, we really want to hold tight. We live in a culture of scarcity. And so we hold tight to what we have, our time, 
our affection, our resources. And yet it's the absolute opposite um, that enriches our lives. And it's when we fall into the trust of believing that we are enough, we have enough, um, we have what it takes. And truly leaning, leaning into that and trusting that and, and reaching out. Um, and when we do that, when we reach out and give freely, um, there really aren't enough words to, to explain the feeling that you receive. It, it's so incredibly enriching and rewarding. And so I guess to people listening today, um, don't, don't be afraid um, to give uh, whatever it is, your time, your talent, your skill, your love. Don't be afraid to give it because when you give it, you're going to be so richly rewarded in return. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like it multiplies. Truly, yeah. truly. My kids, well, when I, was, I think it was my beginning, I used to teach kindergarten and there was a song we used to sing and it was about a magic penny. Um, and it was saying, love is something if you give it away because you'll end up having more. And then one of the lyrics went, it's just like a magic penny, hold it tight and you won't have any but lend it, spend it, and you'll have so many. Um, <laughs> the rest of it. But just, That's I mean, catchy. It is, but it's just, I mean, welcome, welcome to my kindergarten. <laughs> brain. But I love the simplicity of that. You know, when we watch kids, they are not, they don't hold tightly, they give freely, and they yeah. have so much joy in it. Um, and, and not, you know, there's no strings attached. I think that's the biggest thing of creating this project is, like, encouraging people you know just get just to give freely no strings attached you know and there's there's an abundant reward in it Hmm. well deanna what a great note to end our episode on thank you so much for being on the flower podcast this week yeah truly my pleasure thanks for taking the time to visit scott